In today's video, we'll take a dive on how to create simple mockups in Affinity. So the first thing we need to do is to get our image into the mockup document. We can either drag and drop this or use the place menu item from the file menu. I'll just use a simple red fill for now. After selecting the file, we can now drag and click to set the size we want for our imported image. Once we have our image in our document, we need to make sure that the perspective aligns with the mockup. To achieve that, we can use the perspective live filter. First, I'll do a quick and rough perspective correction. It definitely is not going to be perfect, but because this is a live filter, we have the possibility to fine tune it. To fine tune it, I'll select the image layer and lower the opacity to make the image we imported semi transparent. Now let's open the perspective filter again and zoom in to each corner to adjust the nodes so that everything fits perfectly with the screen. Even though the perspective is now correct, we need to make sure the rounded corners and the notch of the screen are correctly shown on top of our mock up image. Or in other words, we need to mask out our image. In most of the mock-up designs, the area that needs to be replaced is in one color, just like in this image. We can select our background image with the laptop and use the Flood Fill Selection tool to select the screen area. The Flood Fill Selection tool can be found under the Select Object tool. While the background image is selected, click on the screen and this will create a selection. With the selection active, we now need to select our perspective corrected image and hit the mask button from the layers panel. This will create a mask for us. Awesome, that looks pretty cool. We can deselect the selection by pressing Ctrl or Command D. In my case, the mask looks pretty good, but sometimes this will not be the case and you probably would need to expand it a bit. Here are two ways of achieving that. First, we can use the maximum blur filter. After we add the maximum blur, we can drag and drop it onto the mask so that it gets applied only to the mask. When we increase the radius in the maximum blur dialog, notice how the mask grows. So this is a very quick way to fix your mask. Optionally, you can add a tiny bit of blur to the mask for a softer transition. We can also use the selection options to grow the mask. Let's first show the mask by Alt or Option clicking on it in the Layers panel. With the Flood Fill Selection tool, we can select the mask area and then use the Pixel Selection option from the Pixel menu and choose Grow or Shrink. We can now grow it with one or two pixels depending on the gap you have. Optionally, we can feather it by again using the Pixel Selection menu item and then using the Feather option. Let's use a feather of one pixel. This will make sure we have a nice gradual mask. The changes we just did were only applied to the selection. To apply the selection to the mask, we first need to make sure we have selected the white color and then use the fill with foreground color from the pixel filters colors menu. Notice how this expanded our mask and feathered it. Pretty awesome. When we zoom in to the end result, we get a very nice smooth mask that blends very naturally. These are the two main methods on how to grow your pixel masks. Instead of using a pixel mask, we can also use a vector mask. We can either trace the screen area manually or use the trace function in the new affinity. I'll make a duplicate of the image with the laptop and apply the image trace option from the vector menu on this copy. As you can see, the trace is not perfect, which means we probably need to manually fine tune it after the trace. For the trace options, setting the edge threshold to 100 and the fitting tolerance to 0 gives the best result. Once we trace the image, we can copy the screen curve and remove the rest of the curves. As expected, this screen curve is not perfect, so let's fine tune it. I'll give it a yellow color to clearly see the difference between the curve and the actual image. Now with the node tool, we can fix the curves to get an exact match with the screen. Too bad that the image trace of Affinity was not very helpful and probably manually tracing would have been faster. I wish they would introduce the possibility to convert a pixel selection into a curve. Anyway, after we fix the curve, we can now drag and drop it 
on our image icon and it will become a vector mask. Pretty cool. We have been focusing on masking out our imported image, but we can also work the other way around, which is actually my personal preferred method. Instead of masking the image, we can also mask out the screen from the laptop image. I'll move the laptop image to the top so that our imported image is below it. Just as before, we can use the flood fill select tool to make a selection from the screen and use this as a mask for the laptop image. When we apply this, only the screen is shown from the image, but actually we want the opposite. Everything except the screen should be shown. To achieve that, we can just invert the mask we created by pressing Ctrl or Command I keyboard shortcut. Let's zoom in to take a closer look. That looks pretty good. I'll remove the mask and show you an alternative method, which in some cases might work better. Instead of using pixel selections to create a mask, we can also use a luminosity or a hue mask. Let's press the Alt or Option key while pressing on the mask icon. This will open up a pop-up menu with a list of masking options. Because the screen is white, I'll go for the luminosity range mask. But if you have a green screen, a hue range mask might be a better fit. In the luminosity range dialog, let's lower the highlights with as result that the bright areas will become transparent. This looks about bright. The disadvantage of a luminosity mask is that it affects all the highlights, so other parts of the image will also become transparent. We somehow have to contain the luminosity mask to the screen area. Because this is already a mask, we cannot mask it. It would have been pretty cool if Affinity would allow masking masks, but I get it. It doesn't make sense, but Affinity does allow compound masks, with which we can achieve the same result. By using the luminosity mask and a new pixel mask inside the compound mask, I can contain it to the screen area. Let me know in the comments if you would like a detailed tutorial on how to achieve this. Anyway, enough masking. Now that we have our base composition, a laptop screen with a mask, and the perspectively corrected red image beneath it, the next step is to replace that red image with our final asset. In this example, I used an affinity document as the placeholder. The significant advantage of this method is that by selecting the layer and clicking the Edit Document button in the toolbar, affinity will open up the embedded document in a new tab. Any edits made here, such as changing the color, are applied live to the main composition upon returning, which streamlines the workflow considerably. For replacing an image that is not a native Affinity document, simply use the Replace Document button in the toolbar. After selecting a new image, one crucial final step is often required when the newly imported image has a different aspect ratio. We will need to adjust its dimension to fit the mask area correctly. Just make sure to turn on the lock option before resizing the image so that the perspective filter stays in place. Once you create the base composition with the mask and the perspective, it can be used very easily to use different placeholders. I hope you liked this video and learned something new today. Thanks again for tuning in and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons before you leave. Until the next video.